Hello, friends. Welcome to this week's episode of Currently Workshopping, a show where we work through the perils and frisson of being alive together. I'm your host, Cece, and today I'll be working through everyone's favorite feeling, jealousy. In this episode, I discuss my recent unhealthy fixation on conventionally attractive skinny white influencers and unpack my complicated history of female friendships. In an attempt to understand my bizarre fixation, I delve into two concepts from feminist legal history, essentialism and intersectionality. No, not the political buzzword intersectionality, but the real original meaning of intersectionality, and then take a real hard look at my irrational emotions in all their ugly glory. Before we get started, the biggest heart to fantasy fanatic for leaving a review, you are a gem and I hope to indeed keep it up and make you proud. Oh. And a friend who listens to these episodes recently asked me why I post these on YouTube versus Spotify or something, and I actually had to tell him that my show is on Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Google Podcasts and really wherever you listen to podcasts. So if you'd like an audio-only experience, you can find the links to the show on Spotify and Apple Podcasts below, although I certainly have no problem with you watching this visual version. Now let's dive in. It shouldn't be a surprise that I'm a huge fan of research. Like, I genuinely just love researching, particularly about people or cultural phenomena. So, of course, before I quit my job to start the sabbatical, I did a ton of research about content creation, watched countless YouTube videos, read substacks by journalists and influencers, listened to podcast episodes. When I was working, I tended to use my downtime to watch anime or TV or play video games. So this whole genre of user-generated content consumption was a little more foreign to me. And I don't know what it was, perhaps the algorithms, internalized racism, or my own, I really don't know, but I did mostly watch white girls, conventionally attractive skinny white girls. And through that watching, that consumption, I marked their content, their materials, and more importantly their success as the benchmark to which I needed to compare my own. They were like the influencer canon or something. In the same way that a lot of aspiring novelists look to Hemingway or Fitzgerald, I looked to these girls. This unfortunately led to a lot of jealousy and comparison on my part. I've had a pretty up and down past few days when it comes to this whole self-employment thing, and at the same time, I've seen some of these other white women who are part of the influencer canon. Let's just give them all a pseudonym, okay? Heather, right? Because that's really what they all are to me in an amorphous blob kind of way. They're all Heather. I'll go into some more detail on my Patreon episode this week, so head on over there if you want some blind items about these Heathers, but for our purposes, let's just call them all Heather. And seeing them achieve success, okay, let's take that back because it's only financial success, and to be honest, I do not want to create the type of content that they create, nor go down the trajectory that many of them seem to be aspiring towards. But to see them achieve the kind of financial success that I've been wanting as a creator has truly reared in me the green horns of jealousy. Since now my sabbatical year is more than halfway over, I've been feeling this abject low-grade panic all the time. I tend to panic when time is running out, like I needed to get to the point during LSAT prep that I finished all sections with more than five minutes to spare, because if I looked at my watch and saw that I had less than five minutes left, I would start panicking and make mistakes. I don't know if you ever feel this weird time dilation, but when I have two minutes to answer one question, even if I know I usually can answer a question in less than two minutes, I panic about those two minutes so much that I end up not being able to answer that question at all. And these last few months of my sabbatical year have felt just kind of like that, like I'm looking down at my watch during a very important exam and seeing that there's less than five minutes left, which means that I'm now way more prone to panicking and making mistakes, like maybe this is a mistake right now. Meanwhile, in my latest Heather stalking session, I see Heather amass thousands of paid subscribers on Substack, patrons on Patreon for, what, sharing dating tips, product recommendations? Really? This is where the worst part of myself comes out, the part that I'm sure would just be typing away on any snark forum like Pretty Ugly Little Liar, RIP by the way, or maybe DRIP because it sometimes got toxic as hell. And I immediately construct arguments in my head about how I'm better than them in some way and how it's not fair that they're more successful than I am. And it's petty. It's so petty. Like, I've been jealous when Heather fundraised more for a charitable cause than I did. That's sick, you know? That's like really sick and petty. And because I wasn't born a nice person, this brings out my basest instincts of being a hater. So I set out to unpack why I felt this way and how I should be thinking about my jealousy of Heather. And more than that, maybe this desire to 
be Heather? It's something I've often asked myself. If I had the choice, would I choose to live life as myself? I can't count the number of times that I have seen a conventionally attractive white woman do very little on camera to millions of views and thought to myself, Wow, I wish I could do that. But what exactly am I wishing for? To be her, this conventionally attractive white woman? To have the same projection that society shines upon her? Something else entirely? If you couldn't already tell, female friendships have always been really complicated for me. I'm an only child, so without friends, I really was just alone. So I placed a huge premium on making friends ever since I was young because it was the only way I would get to hang out with people my own age. And let me tell you, my early friendships were really weird. When I was, I think, eight, one of my friends just stopped talking to me one day, like cold turkey. And I was distraught, inconsolable. I had no idea what I had done, and she straight up started ignoring me on the bus and at school. I became so obsessed with winning her back and winning her over. I called her home phone. Back then, we only had landlines repeatedly, and she would just pick up the phone and hang it up immediately. I'm an obsessive person by nature, so I probably called like every two minutes for half an hour. I'm not even kidding. It was honestly a little excessive and probably constituted harassment, but my undeveloped eight-year-old mind could not comprehend that my behavior was inappropriate. I was left home alone a lot as a child in case it wasn't clear because I'm sure if a parent saw their child just redialing a number every two minutes for half an hour, it would surely prompt an intervention. Like it was not okay behavior. But it's also not abnormal behavior, you know? When I was a teenager, I used to think that everything that I did was probably weird and something that no one else did because they were much cooler than I was. But as an adult, I've mostly realized that I haven't had an original experience in my whole damn life. The premise of intense female friendships is at the center of tons of media, right? The movie Jennifer's Body, the novel The Girls by Emma Klein, the TV show Yellow Jackets. Maybe it's just that girls are socialized to value emotional friendships more, or maybe it's just that being a teenage girl is like one of the most uncomfortable out-of-body experiences that one can go through. But there was just something about how much I hated myself, my body, who I was at that age, that I wanted to latch on to whatever I thought was beautiful, whoever seemed to be going through life with an ease and assurance which I did not possess. I wish I could say that I grew out of it, this teenage girl fixation on other girls, but I, I don't think so. There's a reason that I still devour TV shows, books, movies about intense female friendships in the way that I do. It's still clearly a topic that pulls at me, that I haven't quite worked through, or else I wouldn't be drawn to those narratives still in such a magnetic manner. I've always relied on media and other people's stories to act as a prism through which I could reflect on my own experiences, so it's always interesting to me which narratives and themes I gravitate towards. They tend to undergird a current insecurity or fear or interest pretty consistently. So when I spent a few weeks deep in snark forums, and I mean deep, deep, like I had to block websites from my phone and browser deep, I could feel that I was developing a sordid, unhealthy fascination with these mostly white girls that others, maybe also mostly white girls, were posting about all the time. It really was like I hadn't grown out of being 16 at all, except there was an interesting wrinkle to this whole thing. My teenage girl fixations were, I think, mostly all on other Asian girls. This is a minor point, sure, but I think important. If this was a lifelong internalized racism thing and desire to be white, then I would expect my fixations to have consistently been on white girls in my adolescence, as my recent fixations were all on white women. But this changing, shifting nature of my fixations meant something more complex, I think. It wasn't that I just wanted to be a white girl. It wasn't that I wanted to be a different Asian girl. It was, I don't know, something else altogether. So I set out to reread some of the feminist texts I had read in law school, because at the heart of all this must be my relationship to other women, no? I don't fixate on men in the same way. Like, I'm aware of who Gary V is, but I don't really care what he's doing, because in my mind, I've already separated out the relevance of a man's experience to my own. This is definitely a false distinction, because of course another man's experience can be relevant to my own. We're all human, after all. But my brain takes this cognitive shortcut where it categorizes men experiences as irrelevant and women's experiences as highly relevant and therefore something to zero in on. It's always interesting to me which identities our brains automatically place upon ourselves and gravitate towards because we are so many things. Walt Whitman's famous poem, Song of Myself, right? Do I contradict myself? Very well then, I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. 
Like, obviously, I am many identities. Woman, Chinese, Asian more broadly, California, New Yorker, immigrant, girlfriend, friend, cat mom. But I don't obsess over the actions of other Californians or girlfriends or cat moms like I obsess over Heather right now. The writer Entazaki Shange captures this muddling of identity beautifully in a poem that reads in part, Being alive and being a woman and being colored is a metaphysical dilemma I haven't conquered yet. Do you see the point? My spirit is too ancient to understand the separation of soul and gender. My love is too delicate to have thrown back on my face. Professor Angela P. Harris starts off one of her law review articles, Race and Essentialism in Feminist Legal Theory, with this quote. In her article, Professor Harris notes that feminist history centers a specific experience of being a woman at the heart of feminism, as if there were this monolithic women's experience that can be described independent of other facets of experience like race, class, and sexual orientation. Harris calls this notion of monolithic experience gender essentialism. So gender essentialism basically assumes universality of an identity's experience, which seems wrong, like intuitively wrong. I know I have a different experience in the world than the conventionally attractive white women whom I recently fixated on. And talking to friends who are also women, we don't all have the same experiences when it comes to school, dating, the workplace, careers. We just don't. If that's the case, it just seems like obviously true, especially in today's day and age. Why is it that gender essentialism still seems so prevalent in our culture? In my own thinking, when I mark Heather's experience as the essential influencer experience, is that not essentialism in a different way? Harris presents a few reasons for the prevalence of essentialism, three of which I found particularly interesting. First, Essentialism is intellectually easy. Like, duh, it's easier to assume that your own experiences or the things that you view are representative rather than to go out, discover other people's experiences, and then come back to synthesize all of your collective experiences. Second, and this one was really interesting to me, essentialism is emotional safety. Because feminism is a movement away from the dominant culture, it is inherently uncomfortable, inherently a struggle. And the only thing worse than struggling and being uncomfortable is to then land amongst more struggles and discomfort. I see this a lot in group dynamics in general, right, where certain people leave a group to become outsiders, but then their new outsider group imposes the same stringent restraints on members, maybe different, modified restraints, but restraints nonetheless. And third, we just need simplifying categories for cognitive reasons, and the unifying category of woman helps to organize experience, even at the cost of denying some other experiences. And I think all three of these reasons fuel why I have fixated on Heather recently. Heather's experiences just come easily to me on the algorithm. To really get a more robust view of other creator experiences, I would have to go out of my way to find the Black creators, the Latina creators, the other Asian creators. They just don't grace my feet as often. Moreover, by fixating on them, it does feel safe. This constant berating of myself, obsessing over what I can't be, it's unhealthy but addictive in the same way that like picking all the skin off my fingers is addictive. It's not good for me, but it feels incredibly emotionally safe and familiar. And I think a lot of us are prone to this spiraling of self-loathing to the degree that we even revel in it a bit. Bojack Horseman is one of my favorite shows, and one of the episodes, excuse my language, stupid piece of shit, really encapsulates the obsessive and addictive quality of self-flagellation. So it's ironic that I generally pride myself on being a smart, thoughtful person, but when it comes to making myself feel bad, I'm not smart or thoughtful about it. In fact, I'm rather intellectually lazy about it because I rely on essentialism so often in my mental models to criticize myself. And if you're listening to this and thinking that the premise sounds related to something familiar, you would be right. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw first laid out her theory of intersectionality in 1989, while Harris's discussion of gender essentialism was published in 1990, so they were contemporaries in feminist legal scholarship. Professor Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality grew out of her analysis of three legal cases suing under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which prohibits employment discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. In one of the cases, DeGraff and Reed v. General Motors, five Black women were suing General Motors for a layoff policy that ended up impacting Black women unevenly. Basically, GM instituted a seniority-based layoff policy, so if you had been with the company longer, you were more likely 
likely to keep your job. But if you were a more recent hire, you were more likely to get laid off. But the five women suing presented evidence that GM simply didn't hire black women prior to 1964. So of course, black women were adversely impacted by the layoff policy. The court dismissed their case, essentially ruling that the policy wasn't sex discrimination because GM had hired white women prior to 1964, and there was another race discrimination complaint against GM ongoing that the court thought would make for more reasonable consolidation of cases. This is where Crenshaw steps in, arguing that treating these black women as purely women or purely black effectively took away their ability to seek legal recourse for the very specific challenges that they were facing as a group. An intersectional approach, on the other hand, recognizes that the group of black women have specific experiences as black women that are distinct from non-black women, including white women, and black men. So if the gender essentialism posed by Harris is the problem, then Crenshaw's intersectionality is the answer. Which brings me back to my initial inquiry. Why have I been so fixated on a bunch of skinny white women? Again, I know that my experiences are not and will not be like theirs. Intersectionality tells me that. But the ease, allure, and addictively harmful quality of gender essentialism makes it so tempting to forget sometimes that my journey will not be like that of white women or black women or men or even other Asian women. It just won't. Like, I need to apply intersectionality to my own life as a means of dissecting my own self-judgments and expectations as well. It can't just be some hoity-toity academic legal concept that I read about in feminist legal theory and only apply to evaluating legal causes of action. It also has to be the solution to my own gender essentialism, creator essentialism, and self-hatred here. And it's funny because I think we all are good at recognizing intersectionality when it comes to others' journeys, right? Like, I tell friends who are going through something that they shouldn't compare themselves to so-and-so, who usually come from family money, have crazy connections due to parents, or are just luckier. But when it comes to ourselves, I always reduce my own progress with essentialism, whether it be gender, racial, or career. Whatever category it is, I always take the view that the experience is a monolith, and that because I'm not having the same experience, as someone of the same gender, race, or current financial pursuit, I am failing. But it's not just that. My abject panic that I feel whenever I look at Heather seems to go beyond that. Like, it's not a measured jealousy. It's straight up an irrational panic. And whenever that strong of a feeling comes up, I think there must be some deeper fear swirling around all of this anxiety, this negative self-talk. One of my recommenders once sent me their rec letter to show me how glowing it was, and it really was. It was a strong letter all around, but I remember one phrase sticking out to me. Cece defies the stereotype of the, quote, shy bookish Asian girl, end quote. She is very aware of the racial and gender stereotypes that unfortunately pervade our modern culture. On the one hand, it was certainly a positive, but on the other hand, even bringing up the stereotype that I was working against felt disheartening. Like, it just reminded me all over again of what the world expected from me, what the world sees when it looks at me, the role I'm expected to take. And shy, bookish Asian girl seems leagues away from taking risks or putting herself out there, no? Shy, bookish Asian girl doesn't quit her stable, well-compensated job. Shy, bookish Asian girl doesn't share her life and thoughts online. And perhaps the more harrowing fear no one cares, much less will pay for shy, bookish Asian girl to create or write or whatever in the same way that they will pay conventionally attractive white woman. And bingo. Of course it comes down to money. Of course it does. All roads lead to Rome. All rivers flow into the sea. All of my panic attacks stem from poor money scripts in late stage capitalism. Because if I didn't have this dwindling sabbatical fund, if I didn't have all these fears around college and grad school funds for my yet unborn children, if I didn't have irrational fears around money due to my upbringing, would I be as fixated on Heather? I mean, that's a pretty dumb hypothetical because I will never know what any of those conditions are like. But I do think about if like I had a trust fund and absolutely no worries around providing for my family in the future, I guess I probably wouldn't be fixated on anyone else. I would just be out there living my best life? Maybe I am just glamorizing the idea of being wealthy way too much, and I still would find something else to fixate on. Heather with better skin or something, right? Or maybe I'm just a jealous hater at heart, but until I feel this financial security that I've never really felt before, 
I guess we'll never know. And that's all for this week. Thank you so, so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and remember to use intersectionality whenever you feel jealous of someone else next. In case you want to dive into the primary sources and other materials, I've linked all references in the show notes below, as well as my website where you can find all of my socials and other projects. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd really appreciate your taking the time for the Holy Trinity. Rate, review, and subscribe, and I'll do a shout out on next week's episode. See you then.